funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, day 23 of the Menendez trial, more testimony from a former U.S. Senate staffer about weird meetings with Egyptian officials not on the senator's official calendar. Plus, daily commuter disruptions force transit labor leaders to hit the rails, demanding answers and calling for more funding to end all these transit troubles. The infrastructure is old and only getting older, more unreliable. The system can't wait any longer. Also, deal or no deal? Are lawmakers close to finalizing a budget? They have only five days left to avert a government shutdown. It's also worth noting that in more than 30 states, they already have their budgets enacted and we're still waiting on a spending bill. So that says something about the way New Jersey conducts its business. And what does it mean to be a vegan? NJPBS debuts a new show, Vegan Pop Eats, that explores what it looks like to live a plant-forward lifestyle. What I want people to understand that this lifestyle show that we have created is to just open your mind to some of the things that you might not have been taught about our lifestyle. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Hello and thanks for joining us on this Tuesday night. I'm Joanna Gagas, in for Brianna Venozzi. While the prosecution in U.S. Senator Bob Menendez's trial continued their questioning today of another key witness, Sarah Arkin. She served as a staffer on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and she shared more details today about secret meetings held between Senator Menendez and members of the Egyptian government. Her testimony, part of the prosecution's attempts to connect several dots that they say prove a quid pro quo between New Jersey's senior senator and co-defendant turned star witness Will Hanna. These new allegations all tying back to earlier in the trial when prosecutors made the case that Menendez helped Hanna secure a halal meat deal. Here to help us connect those dots is senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan, who was in the courtroom once again. Brenda, what were some of the more significant points that Sarah Arkin made on the stand today? Joanna, it was a real fencing match today. As you said, on the stand was the government's witness, Sarah Arkin. Now, she's a staffer at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, where she worked for Bob Menendez, and she has testified she thought that some of his meetings with Egyptian officials were set up in weird and unusual ways. Now, she engaged in some verbal sparring with Avi Weitzman. He is the defense attorney for Senator Menendez, and he's trying to show jurors that, essentially, this is just the senator doing his job, that there was nothing weird about it. So during cross-examination, he's trying to get Arkin to give simple yes or no answers to questions, and she's refusing, saying some of these questions are just too complicated, Joanna. She's <laughs> saying that when you're talking about Egyptian foreign policy and committee protocol, it goes beyond yes or no answers. And it got so combative that at one point, Weitzman asked her, look, did the prosecution advise you to avoid yes and no answers when you were going uh, into, into testimony today, Joanna? Well, Brenda, she was calling some of those meetings weird, right, said that they were not scheduled. She also provided some detail about Nadine Menendez on some of these trips with Senator Menendez. What did she offer? Joanna, she called Nadine Menendez, quote, challenging. She said that the senator's wife went with them on what's called a CODEL, which is a congressional delegation trip to Egypt, and that Nadine allegedly wanted to shop and hit some vacation spots like Sharm el Sheikh or even go on a trip to Lebanon, and that Arkin kept Nadine on a tight leash. Nadine apparently complained to staffers, and according to her testimony, Arkin says when Menendez heard about that, he backed up his staffers, not Nadine. And that kind of falls into the defense's narrative, which says that it was Nadine who was stirring the pot, not the senator. He was just doing his job. 
Okay, so Brenda, how did prosecutors connect uh, what we hear from Sarah Arkin about these secret meetings to what they presented earlier in the trial about Will Hanna and this halal meat deal? How do they make that connection here? Well, we had her testimony about how Senator Menendez wanted to help his co-defendant in this trial, Will Hanna, establish this monopoly on certifying halal meat for Egypt. And so what the uh, prosecution is claiming is that the senator did a favor for Egypt by urging the Department of State, the State Department, to get involved in these delicate um, diplomatic negotiations over a hydroelectric dam on the Nile River. Egypt opposed the dam. But the defense to Day argued that Menendez didn't do a favor. He was acting out of alarm, basically, because of the Trump administration. Who they directed to handle this tricky diplomatic situation was Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, and that the senators felt that this was not a guy who had sufficient resources or experience to wade into this. Really, it's a flash. It was a flashpoint on the diplomatic map at that point, Joanna. Okay, so when we look at how the prosecutions laid out their case, we know they were expected to wrap up tomorrow. Does it look like they're on track here? It does not look like they are on track. It looks like we are going to be going into the middle of July before the jury gets this case, Joanna. All right, senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan, great wrap up as always. Thank you so much. Thank you. Transit's been top of mind for folks here in New Jersey, from train delays that have plagued travelers these last few weeks to debates over how to fund the failing NJ Transit system. Some of those delays last week caused by overhead wire failures from Amtrak that halted service in and out of New York Penn Station. Well, that led Congressman Frank Pallone to say enough is enough in a call last night with Amtrak's CEO, saying the company needs to take immediate action to fix the problem, especially given the significant federal investments from Congress for the Northeast Corridor train service. Now, over at the Port Authority bus terminal, Congressman Josh Gottheimer held an event today calling for more funding from U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg for the expansion of that bus terminal. And transit workers were out canvassing today calling for more reliable service and a sustainable budget that's not burdening riders who depend on the rails to travel. Ted Goldberg spoke to them and has that story now. The last few weeks have been a nightmare for NJ Transit riders, and it hasn't been much better for those who work on the buses. Our members bear a lot out here in these, these streets. Um, everything trickles down, right? It's a trickle down effect. So if a bus operator is late, they're bearing a burden because the train was late and, you know, everything falls on us. Union members, environmentalists and transit advocates spent the morning speaking to passengers at stations statewide, asking about what people want. Better service. Okay, thank you so much. The question is whether they'll get better service, especially with that 15 percent fare hike coming next week. Mass transit, you know, moves people, they get people to work, they get people to school, they get people to shop. They stimulate the economy. Plus, all of our workers need a, a fair share, you know. So we need something that guarantees our jobs and protects the riders as well. We want better equipment, on-time performance. The infrastructure is old and only getting older, more unreliable. The system can't wait any longer. We can't wait any longer. Riders can't wait any longer. As Amtrak and NJ Transit squabble over who's to blame, a new revenue stream is projected to support the state's buses and trains. The corporate transit fee, a 2.5% tax on a small percentage of companies operating in the Garden State. A modest tax on the country's biggest and most profitable corporations. The fee will only affect corporations with profits over $10 million annually. For all these riders already overburdened with fare increases, inflation, the high cost of living, corporations are making record profits. Passing the corporate transit fee is important. Decades of underinvestment and lack of care by transit lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have crippled New Jersey transit. But I promise you this, this is not where New Jersey's transit story ends. While the corporate transit fee is currently on schedule to be a part of this year's budget, the plan has faced heavy criticism from some of New Jersey's businesses. I commend Governor Murphy for not kicking the can down the road. He is addressing this issue today and for all transit riders. Transit advocates say funny things can happen in Trenton, 
So they're not going to stop until the transit fee is official. Until the ink dries on the governor's signature, we will not stop. It is all talk. We need the corporate transit fee in this budget, and we need it now. As you know, things are never certain until the legislature passes a budget and the governor signs it. All too often, a deal may appear to close, but last-minute side deals can derail things. A big test for the state's transit is in two years, when the World Cup comes to the Meadowlands. All those people coming in and out conjures up unpleasant memories of transportation around the Super Bowl 10 years ago. It was a disaster, and honestly, bus operations, which is the side that I'm on, um, we were ready. We had people on the ground ready to move people, and for some reason, uh, rail didn't utilize us. However, if you look back at the Beyonce concert and uh, Miley Cyrus, I believe, New Jersey Transit bus took a lead role in that. There's still plenty of time to prepare for those huge soccer games in 2026. A smaller soccer test starts tonight with Copa America games at MetLife. In Newark, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, lawmakers have just a few days left to finalize a budget deal, and it comes to no surprise to any of us here in New Jersey that there's not even been a bill presented yet. Although late yesterday, Senate Budget Committee Chair Paul Sarlo did announce that a formal spending plan may be released tomorrow and a possible vote scheduled in both houses on Friday. So lots to pick apart here, both from what's inside the budget package to this process that's brought no shortage of criticism from both Republicans as well as many progressive groups groups, all calling for more transparency. Who better to break it all down than our very own budget and finance writer, John Reitmeyer, who's with me now. John, good to see you. What can you tell us? Do you know any details uh, that are possibly in this deal that we know right now legislative leaders on the Democratic side are, are working out with Governor Murphy right now? Yeah, it's good to be here with you. We do see a few breadcrumbs and some uh, little details that have been leaking out in the last few days. And, and one of them is a big one if um, you're uh, looking at how this budget's gonna come together. The governor had been proposing to hike taxes on New Jersey's most, most profitable businesses. That's a proposal that's been around since late February. That's the and, corporate transit fee. Correct, and it looks like that tax is gonna make it into the final deal, at least what um, some sources have been telling me. And uh, you know that's a big uh, piece of the puzzle that would have to come together for us to get a spending bill and for us to get to that finish line. Uh, you know, July one, we need a new budget in place where there's a state government shutdown in New Jersey. Yeah, we're going to get into the timing of all of this as you follow it daily. But a couple things we've been watching: the 20 million dollars for county colleges. They have been pushing really hard for this. It's actually been a point that we've seen both Republicans and some Democrats saying they need to reverse uh, course on. Any word there? It looks like, um, you know, lawmakers throughout the, the, the budget season, you know, the last few months, that's emerged as like a key priority for them. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that make the final cut. You know, last year they pushed to get more funding. Traditionally, the governor takes back some of the funding that lawmakers add on this time of the year. So, you know, we have to see the final budget, but that's an area, as you note, that lawmakers from both parties have identified as a priority. So I would not be surprised to see some of that funding restored when, when we get this final spending bill. There are some other taxes that have been floated, uh, some possible increases, some possible decreases. I'm gonna just laundry list a few of them. Tell us what you know. We've got this potential increase in a sales tax that we heard about. This was a Coughlin idea that maybe at one point he was considering, and then at another point he said it's off the table. Um, then we've got Anchor and this back to school tax break uh, that's going away. Explain. Yeah, we're, we're, we're still waiting on the final numbers. It, it sounds like uh, the, the flirtation with the sales tax hike um, is, is going to be left at just that. I don't, I don't think that that's going to make it, although, again, we still have to see this, this final bill. Um, the back-to-school uh, sales tax holiday is another one that we're keeping an eye on. I think a lot of uh, parents took advantage of that in recent years, fighting high inflation. Um, that was due to go away under the governor's budget, so we'll see if lawmakers go along with that as well. Um, you know, Anchor, the, the benefits for Anchor were on course to stay flat. So we know that property taxes increased year over year last year. So if the benefits stay flat and you're paying more in property taxes, that's in essence a tax hike. Uh, not directly delivered to you from Trenton, but in effect you do end up paying more. So that's another one where we're, we're just going to have to wait and see. Let's talk about the timing of this. We, we see Sarlo saying this could come out on Wednesday, possibly even Thursday, a vote Friday, possibly Saturday. 
We know that uh, groups like For the Many and We the People are out there today calling for the 72-hour period minimum between the time that a budget is presented and voted on. That doesn't seem likely, does it? Not based on the timeline uh, that's been laid out so far, or we would generally have to have the budget introduced like right now, um, and, and I don't expect that. Uh, and if you look at it from their perspective, this is money that we pay New Jersey residents in income taxes, sales taxes, our employers pay business taxes. So they want to have a look at how lawmakers are divvying up all, appropriating all the money that we as taxpayers contribute. It's also worth noting that in more than 30 states, they already have their budgets enacted and we're still waiting on a spending bill. So that says something about the way New Jersey conducts its business. Yeah, it doesn't look good for us, does it? Do you think that this goes into the weekend that lawmakers are convening on Saturday to vote? I wouldn't be surprised the way that it's playing out. There's a lot that has to happen even behind the scenes when there is an agreement. There's a lot of, you know, the budget spans hundreds of pages and they all have to be written by staff. So I would not be surprised, unfortunately, if, if this does drag out into the weekend, but, but we'll see. We will see. John Reitmeyer, thank you as always. You're welcome. Well, two federal judges have halted President Biden's SAVE plan. That's the latest version of his student loan forgiveness plan. The matter landed in the courts after two Republican-led states, Missouri and Kansas, sued the administration, alleging that SAVE was simply a workaround after the Supreme Court blocked the broader Biden loan forgiveness plan last year. Well, under SAVE, a person's student loan payment would be based on their income and family size, and borrowers would pay no more than 5% of their discretionary income on student loans. It also prevents interest from accruing when a borrower pays the loan amount but can't cover the interest, and it would forgive borrowers who owe $12,000 or less after 10 years. Well, more than 8 million people who were about to see those savings and more go into effect in August will now wait indefinitely until the matter works its way through the courts. The Biden administration has says it will continue fighting for this relief, so this case could end up right back in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Turning to Wall Street, a mixed day in the markets. Here's how stocks closed for the day. Support for the Business Report is provided by Experience the Vibrancy of Newark's Arts and Education District and Halsey Street. Halsey, a neighborhood built on heart and hustle. Visit halseyn-w-k.com for the 2024 Halsey Fest schedule. Terrific team here at NJPBS has produced another incredible show for you called Vegan Pop Eats. It takes you on a journey to change some of the perceptions around veganism. Hey, all you meat eaters, don't tune out just yet because this show's host, Angela Yvonne, will show you where some of your food originates and the process that brings those farm fresh foods right to your table. Her goal? To help you understand the benefits of plant-forward foods and some of the less harmful alternatives that are available to you. Angela is with me now. Angela, congratulations on the launch of the show. Tell us what we can expect from this first episode. Well, from the first episode, you can expect, oh, so many things because I'm just so grateful that so many people wanted to be part of this. But the purpose of the show is to sort of introduce people to plant forward living because, you know, I am a vegan. I've been a vegan for almost eight years. And I realized that um, being a vegan has a bad reputation. And I felt that this was a space that would sort of invite everyone in to learn a little bit more about what they're putting into their body and just, you know, sort of changing their habits to live a more abundant life. So uh, we're going to delve into a lot of those topics and what it means to be plant forward. Um, we're going to talk mm -hmm. about some of the misconceptions of veganism. But I want to just first Absolutely. show people what this show looks like. It comes to life in color. We have a clip. Let's take a look. I'm Angelie Vaughn, and I am a journalist and content creator, changing the perception of veganism through conversation, cuisine, and conscious living. And health is our biggest currency, so. I want to say amen, because you're, you know, you're preaching my gospel. 
Together, we are going to explore. New, you want to have me in my kitchen burning something down. The foraging is very dramatic. So we're about to go over to the farmer market and you want to show me about all this plant goodness. Serve it up. We're going to educate. When you're operating in the plant forward lifestyle, I'm finding that it's easier to talk to people when you're showing them. So this one is actually called Bull's Blood Beet, and I promise that it's vegan. And we're going to elevate your mind to the limitless, bountiful life of being on the green side. And thank you for behaving. <laughs> Most importantly, thank you for behaving. When you eat plants, their goodness, their chlorophyll gets in you, and then they shine out of you like a beacon onto the world. Believe me, it's dope over here. Oh man, it makes me want to be on the farm with old. you. Yeah, what's that? That will never get old. <laughs> no, it doesn't get old. Makes me want to be there on the farm with you. So you mentioned living a plant forward life. And I mean, you're in this show, you're out there, you're cutting down bamboo, you're with the bees, you're, you're uh, foraging. What do you want people to understand about what it means to actually live a plant forward life, you know, eat a plant forward diet? Well, what I want people to understand that there is no one way for this journey. Um, I was a vegetarian for a short period of time, but for me, I just knew that there was more. And so what people, what I want people to understand that this lifestyle show that we have created is to just open your mind to some of the things that you might not have been taught about our lifestyle, um, sort of welcome you into what it means to be plant forward and plant forward is I think it's a more jazzier way of saying limiting animal products and growing to be without eating any animal products and how abundant it is over here on the day or over here on the green side. I'm just still gagging over seeing that again. So sorry for slip. So, so sorry we, for stumbling on my words. We're here in the garden state, right? People often forget yeah. why we're called the garden state. And I love shows like yours that actually go and show people why we are the garden state. Why were you with bees? Uh, and what were you doing with that bamboo, with those bamboo stalks? What's happening in this episode? Well, the reason why we were with bees is because vegans do not eat honey. And they don't eat honey because of the mistreatment of bees. So I wanted to show people that you can have honey with an ethical way. So we decided that we needed to hear it from an ethical beekeeper, the information, because there's just so much information going around about plant forward lifestyle, reasons why we don't eat animals. And I just wanted to make sure that in this episode that people heard it from experts and that people understood that you know, if you get with an ethical beekeeper, you can still enjoy the medicinal properties of honey. Which we know is one of nature's greatest medicinal uh, yes. cures out there, right? The bamboo, Absolutely. explain what was happening with the bamboo. Well, with the bamboo, that was part of the foraging aspect because foraging is something that, you know, our ancestors and people have done for years. And now it has come back into the forefront because people are really wanting to know where their food is coming from. And they're also wanting to get back to basics where there's not a lot of food that has like pesticides and chemicals and things of that nature. So with the bamboo, we were with New. She has a Vietnamese, Vietnamese restaurant on the Upper East Side, I think. And she was there to forage because she makes special dishes with bamboo. And who knew we had bamboo in New Jersey? We have bamboo all over New Jersey. This episode is yes. informative, but it's also fun. We know it's a pilot episode. What do you hope to bring in any future episodes? Where does this go from here? Well, where it goes from here is that we are going to explore everything about plant forward living, the vegan lifestyle, because people think that it's just about food. We have vegan hotels. We have vegan fashion shows. There used to be a vegan couture house in New York City before COVID. Um, the automobile um, industry is starting to incorporate vegan leather inside of their cars. There's just so much going on, yeah. vegan beauty products. So there's so many ways that if you're not ready to jump out the window and give up meat, you can become vegan through your beauty products. So, you can become vegan through your recycling. So informative. We can't wait to see what you do. Angela, Yvonne, good luck and congratulations. Thank you so much. 
The pilot of Vegan Pop Eats, It's Dope on the Green Side, premieres tonight at 7 p.m. on the NJPBS YouTube channel, and then right here on NJPBS tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Check it out. That does it for us tonight. Before you go, a reminder to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen to us anytime. I'm Joanna Gagas for the entire team here at NJ Spotlight News. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSCG Foundation. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member. I'm Gloria Monks, 2024 president of New Jersey Realtors. Whether it's guiding first-time buyers through the home buying process or securing space for small business owners, New Jersey Realtors have been helping their clients through real estate transactions for more than a century. No matter what your unique needs are, there is a knowledgeable New Jersey Realtor for you. Learn more at njrealtor.com find.